So, Michelle, <laughs> tell us what Karen Karen does. Karen is a support program. <laughs> Is there any um, threshold or access to get to your program? No, anybody. So we're talking developmental um, disabilities, health disabilities, mental health disabilities. Um, if you think your child may have some issues, you qualify I know <laughs> There's no. There's brochures up here that you're going to try to Any of the information you hear, make sure you sign up and we'll get you in Contact. Tell me how you run into your children. Um, so if I were thinking my child um, had a, a deficit, how would I find you? to us 
is that we at Gerald's believe that everyone in our community has something to teach us and something to contribute to their community. This event could not occur without the support of my team at Gerald's. This is their example of us living this value and sharing it with you. We truly believe it's the differences in people that make them special. The goal tonight is acceptance and an increased understanding of what it takes to include people with different needs in our community. The more we understand each other's perspectives, strengths, weaknesses, those of the support agencies that have protocols, the more that we can help each other. It's about positive energy and positive conversation. Please do try to use people first language. People have autism, they are not autistic people. I trip up on this from time to time, but I should not. It is a big difference and it does mean something. This is being recorded by Public Access TV for rebroadcast on Channel 2. Long live Channel 2. Um, it is our goal to reach as many people as possible. Please keep this in mind when you share stories and so forth. It is going to be rebroadcast. I would also like to add that I am not an expert in autism in any way. I am working on becoming the expert on one 16-year-old boy named Garrett. He's my son. And he has what I have called classic autism. With that said, I'd like to introduce our panel here. We have Joel and Corey Gergi, who, let's see, I'm supposed to turn this over and actually read. Their journey is centered on Claire. An 11-year-old twin daughter, Claire also has classic autism. Their family made the decision to move from the west side, or what we would call the coast, <laughs> because our community and schools seem like a better fit. They went from the west side to a rural community. They aren't the only ones. There are also people that leave this community to go other places. We live our lives based on our kids' needs. I would also like to introduce Amy Coker. Amy has worked both in Kittitas and Yakima County in their respective birth to three programs. By the way, if I get any of this wrong, since I made it all up on my own. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, she worked there as a special ed home educator. She currently serves on the Washington State Interagency Coordinating Council for Early Support for Infants and Toddlers. That one needs an acronym. I'm sure it's got one. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Amy. I appreciate you being here. We also have Mike Coppin. Mike Coppin is the school resource officer with the Ellensburg Police Department. Thank you so much for being brave enough to come and talk to us. We have LaDonna Fogel, um, who is someone incredibly near and dear to my heart. Um, she is the Kittitas High School and Middle School Special Ed teacher. Is that right? One of two. See, I should know that since she <laughs> teaches my son. Um, she also, I believe, sort of began her career with my son way back. When he was three. When he was three, so 15 years ago. And from there, you actually went and got a degree and became a teacher. And specialized for your. Our community is incredible. Uh, and to see that just is awesome. Thank you for being here. Jim Ayers is currently the outstation manager of the, I just got you have a new name, Washington Developmental Disabilities Administration, is that right? Close enough. <laughs> and Jim has been involved in this world, both in the Ellensburg School District as what Bill Leeham now holds, correct? As the special ed director for the Ellensburg School System. You also have been a principal, and I'm sure played lots of other roles that I don't know about. Oh, yeah, I start off as a special ed teacher. No. No. Um, and he also has been involved in my son's life and that Kittitas and Ellensburg schools work together to allow him to participate in some of the resources here um, in Ellensburg that weren't available in Kittitas. Thank you, Jim. And the, the next person that has a blank on my script because it's my mom. Uh, this is Annette Williams. Um, she obviously is the grandmother of my son and she has um, also was a special ed teacher and has been involved in the special needs world for a very long time. Thank you for also being brave enough to come. Uh, we have two representatives from Elmview. We should stand over here so I'm not in front of everybody. We have Linda Custer and we also have Patty Canterbury. 
Linda is the new vocational administrator, and Patty is the old vocational <laughs> administrator. Uh, they both still work at Elmview. Patty is now operations manager. Um, thank you both for being here. So what I thought we would do is we'd first start talking about what is autism. And again, I already told you I'm not an expert, so maybe I'm not the one that should do this. But I will give you a parent's perspective, or my perspective. So if you go to the academic world, I, this is sort of what I distill. Autism spectrum disorder is a complex neurodevelopmental disorder occurring in one in 108 individuals with more frequent occurrence in boys than girls. ASD, autism spectrum disorder, is a neurological disorder that impacts brain development in social communication, repetitive, restrictive behaviors. The onset of symptoms is generally within the first three years of life, although the presentation varies wildly among individuals. OK, pretty close. It's not DSM, but. Numbers have changed. 1 in 88. 1 in 88. Um, 1 in 55 right, boys. Right. So this is Rolf's version of autism. It's a spectrum disorder. So over here, you have Asperger's. Over here, you have what I call classic autism. So classic autism is very, what I call involved. I don't like severe because it's my son, okay? So we're calling it involved. If nonverbal, um, lots of stimming activity, um, less looking people in the eye, just involved. I don't know that they're any more complex than Asperger's. In fact, when I see the Asperger's world, I go, holy cow, I'm glad I don't deal with that. But we're all lumped together. So ASD is really a lump of symptoms that are put together under a single label. This makes about as much sense as putting cancer under one label and saying, let's go find the cure. You couldn't, because you have to slice and dice to figure it out. But that's just one of the levels of this. But it really is a lumping of symptoms. The causes. Some of it appears to be genetic. Some of it would appear to be environmental. I don't think anybody knows. Um, I, I'm not here to discuss that. I don't know that there's a lot of relevancy here. Prevalence. When I started in this world 10, 15, well, I don't want to say how long. I guess it's 18 years ago about. It was 1 in 10,000. So when I looked at those odds, it was like, no, that's not possible, so let's go look for something else. Now they're saying it's maybe even as much as 1 in 50, according to the last um, reports from the CDC. Now, one of the things is, is it's four times more common in boys than it is in girls. So that would be 1 in 250 girls, 1 in, oh, I don't have that one, like 35 or something boys is what that equates to. This is an interesting question, this prevalence, because a lot of, a lot of times you've got to say, well, it's just better diagnosed. People understand it better. We have educators in the room, is that correct? People that work in this world. We also have people outside the education. Is autism more prevalent now than it used to be? Um, how many agree with that? Can you just raise your hand? Okay, I don't know the reason why, but I know you can't hide my son. It's not like you're going to not diagnose him with something, okay? When my son was in the developmental preschool, he was the only one. Now there's five that I know. Now there's five in our community. There's 350 births thereabouts at the Kittitas Hospital. One in 150 will be diagnosed on autism. This is something we better learn to accept. Most people would tell you autism can't be cured. It can be improved. There's better outcomes and there's worse outcomes, but there's not a cure. So again, it's something we as a community are going to deal with. People with autism have an interesting trait. They look like everybody else. That is a very weird thing. And I'll tell you a story that my uncle Rolf told me. Cerebral palsy. Now this is a man who's been marked from birth as special needs. He ended up running the Berkeley, California special ed program. He was on President's Ford Council for um, Physical Fitness, Special Needs, and something like that. Um, 
he told me, Garrett is going to have a very difficult time in this world because people can't tell and they don't know what to do. So when he presents his symptoms, the general public has no idea why. None. As hard as it is with Down syndrome, do you know what you're dealing with? Just a fact. It is something very weird about autism. Also autism, life expectancy is just like yours. Autism is not new. It didn't just start. There are people in our community that are 60, 70, beyond years old. In our community right now, it always has been. It's not new. There's a lot more of it. Um, but autism really is not necessarily the little child. It's people at all ages. And my son is going to outlive my life. My son, well, I don't even know how to say this, so I'm going to leave that alone. There are lots of things you can't say um, and, well, <coughs> without having problems. And so sometimes we just have to let them go. Would someone like to add to my brief, long description of autism? You have a great way of putting it. Would you mind sharing for me? You, you did it in the newsletter. Um, you mentioned it. Yeah. Um, most of us have iPhones or iPads at least. And uh, um, might be a way to, to describe it even to children or siblings at this point. I say that it's like an iPhone without an operating system. And all the information is there, but there is no clear way to access it. And uh, to remember that when it looks like they can't speak or can't talk, they've got a lot to say and a lot of things going on. They just can't find it at the right time. So. Would anyone else like to add anything? They talk about social deficits. I can put a face on that. My son's never had a birthday party. You know what? My son doesn't care. Never cared about Christmas. Never. Is this right, Grandma? It's kind of hard, isn't it? <clears throat> but it's true. I mean, that's what not having social interaction means. Not motivated. Now, that does not mean that they don't love. That does not mean that they don't have feelings. If you've ever been hugged by someone with autism, you've been touched by an angel, and you know it. Um, I don't know any other way to say it. But it's, you know, you read this social deficits and so forth, but that really means something. And People, children, look at you and they want to imitate you. They want to communicate with you. That's how they're hardwired. You take that away, what's their motivation? They're fine. They don't need you. They're perfectly happy. Thank you. Perfectly happy. There is very little you have that will motivate them. Now, I should say, I'm talking about my son. Classic autism. Asperger's different. I don't really even know Asperger's. Because I don't live like that. It's totally different. I have people that do. We're going to call on you and talk about it. But it is different, isn't it? It's all, in fact, it's the opposite. They want social interaction, but they don't know how to do it. Is that right? So right. So it's almost worse because they want to have friends. They want to have a birthday party. My son doesn't want to have one. Doesn't care. Theirs do. That's got to be really hard to deal with. Really hard to deal with. Okay, so let's take this from the beginning. Let's talk about a diagnosis. How does this happen? Um, so we're just gonna try to walk situations through this and we'll see how this works. So Corey, you're gonna have your first child, okay? Um, I know and you know now, in the end, we're gonna have a diagnosis of autism, okay? But you just had, well, you're getting ready to have a child. Pretty excited. Yeah. Lots of stuff going on. Grandma's pretty happy. Yeah. Grandma's going to get up and leave on me. I'll just bet you. Do <laughs> um, you have a birth? Okay. You know anything's going on? Was the birth okay? Yeah. Any complications? Okay. Yep. Um, doctor knows anything going on? No. We're all happy. You're on your way home? Yep. Okay. So tell me when you start to know something's going on. All right, now i got to stop for a second. Okay, there's three ways this happens. One is classic autism, one is what I call regression, and the other one is Asperger's. Okay? So I'm going to ask, no, we're going to go through regression, okay? Okay. Okay. So, how is it, by the way, this is a twin, right? Yes. Less, twice. Yes. Okay? All right, so Claire and Zoe are twins. Go uh, Around the age of... Neither of them were talking, and I was starting to get concerned. Um, everybody said that twins are late, and they talk to each other in their own languages. I didn't have anything to worry about. Um, then I had another baby, actually, and Zoe started talking. Um, she was quite motivated. 
start talking and left Claire in the dust. So it was quite obvious at two that she was stuck no more. And up to two things were progressing normally? Yep. She was up right with Zoe. Um, okay, so what what do you do now? So if this happens, you notice this. Do you notice this because it's that obvious or is it friend family tells you that? Friends tell you that? Do you want to pass? My mom. Okay. You know what? It was my mom too. Um, and so what do you do? You you hear that, you know. And so grandparents, think about this. You're the ones in the position of telling us there's something up. We don't want to hear that. You don't want to tell us. But the statistics say if you don't catch it by age three, you're losing ground. <laughs> Pretty hard position for everyone to be in here. Pretty hard position. So grandma screws up the courage. Um, oh, you've already got your box of Kleenex. I, know. I have several of mine in case you need them elsewhere. So what happens now? You, you know something's going on. Someone's mentioned it to you. Uh, I decided to find a doctor that knew something about special needs. So what happened with your first doctor? Um, I didn't even go there. Okay. Well, I just moved as well, so I decided to pick someone who knew something sure. about special needs. So I took both of them to the doctor. And said, I think they have autism. And he laughed and said, no, they don't. Okay. So you go home. What's that like on your side, Dad? Well, actually, at the end of it, at the end, he said, OK, you have to write. And you can go see someone for X amount of dollars. And? And so. We went home. <laughs> <laughs> sure. And then what do you do from there? Call the school. Did they tell you to do that? I don't remember. Sure. Sure. So you reached out to the medical profession, um, kind of got something, and in the end, you found the school. Okay? So let's talk about non regression. And I don't know if there's anyone who wants to put a face on it. I can't. Michelle's supposed to be here, but she ran away. Smart. Yeah, and you're thinking, why didn't I run away? So, Garrett was born, no problems, no complications. We, at age two or three, started to notice something. I think probably Grandma brought it up, certainly friends brought it up. I know I can remember on a ski vacation, he was just doing stuff, and we're like, that's really weird. And just not playing with things the way children would play with things. And our friends were kind of looking at us. It's just like, pretty weird. And so then we started looking, because you know, you've got the internet, lots of stuff. So you start searching on your own, and so you start coming up with stuff. Um, I remember what all it was, but at one point it was like deafness. It's like, oh, okay, cool, we can deal with that. We know what to do with that. And then another sensory integration was another one. And you know, you just go into these things. And you talk to the doctor, the doctor says, don't worry about it. You know, everyone develops at their own speed. Oh, it's so frustrating. And so so we didn't get a diagnosis. Um, eventually, we took our child, child Garrick, to Children's Hospital. And of course, I was a good husband and stayed and worked. And my wife went, and she met with the best neurologist from Seattle, who told her her son was mentally retarded, go to the schools. End of subject. That was it. OK, so not a diagnosis, but being told what to do. <coughs> so that's, so much similar to some people? Okay. So now let's talk about Asperger's, which is really different from what I understand. Um, so, same story, birth, everything's great, going along and so forth. How do we start to know there's an issue? Uh, does it happen early, young? And I think that his motor skills were
go to throw him a ball, he couldn't catch. He he got kicked out of swim lessons here at the pool when he was around first grade because they thought he was a smart aleck. But they told him to throw his the toy down into the pool and run down there and probably practice diving. And he would just go like this. And it would just fall. And he kept doing it. And they thought he was being cute. But he couldn't get it. He's 16 now. And it's all he can do to remember to do the hand-eye coordination. Um, I remember in kindergarten they were upset because he couldn't cut paper. He was too slow, but he could read very hard. So people will look at him and they just think he's acting out when he really can't process it. And that's the hardest thing to watch is when they just think he's lazy. Where did you get a diagnosis? <laughs> <laughs> the school wanted a diagnosis. They did one on their, their own and they said it was nonverbal. And it was pretty close. Um, then they um, sent me to, I think it's Dr. Oldham here. And to where? I think it was Dr. Oldham here. Okay. And he said, he was with him for five minutes and said, it's Asperger's. And um, so then he referred us to Children's Village. And then a doctor there said, also, Asperger's, a doctor in Anaconda. And the school district is still not convinced that it's Asperger's. I mean, he's 16 now. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. I'd like to add something on Asperger's children. They have they develop special interests. They can have a special interest in trains, toilets, cars, <coughs> washing machines, people. Yeah. Anything, and they have a real intense focus. They can stay on this track for hours or hours, hours, hours and hours, or perhaps days, or something like that. And they they seem to get wired to where they have these special interests, and the social skills take a real slide when they do that. They aren't interested in developing that part of their life. And sometimes the social skills they want in, and sometimes they don't want in. I think that there's a fine line there. I'm going to have you hold on to your thoughts, and we're going to come back to family stuff. Um, thank you. And let's jump back to diagnosis. So, some children with some children, some people with autism, autism, Asperger's. Let me get on track. <laughs> may not be diagnosed in their entire lives, but a lot of times it happens after high school. It happens in their 30s and 40s and 50s. So they're gone through this huge period of time not knowing what's going on, no one recognizing this is a huge problem, huge problem, because you've got substance abuse problems, you've got suicide problems, all this stuff, because again, my son doesn't care. He just doesn't care. He's perfectly happy. These kids care a lot. Um, and they get there something different. That's gonna be so tough. A lot of behavior problems as I understand it in that world. But now let's, so we got a diagnosis somehow. One of these ways we got a diagnosis. So the system steps in, right? And someone calls you and says, this is what you need to do. Is that what happens, moms? No, no? So what, what happens then? So you get a diagnosis. Um, what, you, you hear that, the doctor says that then what happens? Immediately thereafter. Want me to answer? Go ahead, yeah, please. please. I, I got a diagnosis from my youngest. I have one who's got Asperger's, pretty high functioning, and I have another who's got classic autism, 11 months apart. So I'm dealing with, with both these worlds. When I got Jackson, my youngest, is diagnosis with classic autism, I'm very blessed to have an amazing doctor in town who, Dr. Wells, who gave me the Williams number on a card and said, call Michelle Williams, get a hold of her, your life will be better. And so in this community, I was lucky enough to have that option. I don't know if other communities are as lucky, but that's what happened with us. So here's the interesting thing. There is no system. Um, the system is, you might be told, well, you probably will be told, contact your school system. So let's kind of pick that up because 
we're going to contact the schools, and any of you can help me with this because I don't even really know how that happens. But no one calls the mom and says, hey, this is what you need to do. You are told to contact the schools. You don't know who to contact, right? So you're going to dial the main number for the school system in a moment of your darkest depression because your dream was just killed. And you are going to say what to the lady who answers the phone? Can you help me? I, I mean, I don't even know contemplate, but that's the system. For everybody, that's the system. Any special needs, go to the schools. Okay, so I'm going to call the schools. Anyone, what happens when I call the schools? Where does it go? Go ahead. I, I, I can. Yeah. First off, if you don't mind, I just interject really quick. Being an educator, the whole reason I was um, brought into the birth to three program is because I, I am to a parent. Um, I am Kind of an odd fellow here tonight. Uh, we have a child with chromosome ring 18, which is one in 43 in the registry when he was born. So um, I, I, I understand, and that's for, I wanted to mention that because uh, this program, early intervention, is dear to my heart. And um, what I wanted to pick up on with was that um, after a child is diagnosed, they t if you have a good physician. Who, who has connections in the community and understands who the family resource coordinator is in the community, should pick up that phone right away and call that FRC and have them call the parents. Um, that's the ideal. And there are systems in place at a state level. There are grants, one in particular is called the Great Minds Act, where they are taking parents around the state to physician's office, having them tell their story of, of the fiasco of getting that connection with early intervention, which is such an important program for children, um, and, and educating them and telling them, get to know who your FRC is. Here's a parent What's story. What's an FRC? Family Resource Coordinator. They are the um, person, the contact person that should be called out of all of the agencies for early support for infant and toddlers. What that is, it's a, it's a program State funded, although now slightly changing, but that's a whole different story. Um, and what they offer you is an educator, a special educator that can come into your home and work. I worked with Deidre. I'm not going to look at you because I'll cry. Um, they offer occupational therapy, physical therapy. And these are families coming in and working in the child's natural environment where they've been proving to learn the best from ages birth to three. And you're basically working with these parents and their children and sitting down with them on the floor and coming up with ideas on how to bring a better dynamic into the household. You wear several hats as an educator, an early intervention educator, you're a counselor one day. Um, you're, you're, you're putting out fires between people and the family. You're creating, um, helping to create order. And I mean, some families just want their child to sit at the table for five minutes. You may work for three months on doing that, but you find a way. And before I go off too much, I can tell you that working through Children's Village down Yakima was such a good experience for me. I encountered in the last year so many children coming in. I, I blow away at how many kids are coming in exhibiting these same exact um, features as children with autism that are coming in and parents are saying the same thing. They're two, they get 18 months, they stopped walking, or talking, I'm sorry. They stopped looking at me. They disconnected. And it's, it's amazing um, working with these families. They are amazing people. Um, so that's the hope, is that a family will be connected. I can tell you really quick, my first connection was with Michelle. And I had, after my son was diagnosed, I had no one. And I had a pamphlet in my hand. I had Michelle Williams' number on it. And I was scared to death to call her, so I had a glass of wine. <laughs> and then I called her, and I said, my son, they tell me he's mentally retarded. And she said, I hate that word. And then she said, by the way, who is this? <laughs> so from there on, we hit it. And I have to say, as a connection in the, I'm going off a little bit on a tangent, but my friend Elizabeth back there, when I took my baby, I had nobody tell me, that, I mean, my friends disappeared. I went to a luncheon. This is how powerful these community events are. And she picked up my son. And she looked him over. And she said, he's beautiful. He's beautiful. I just wanted to add that in. Thank you.
and this is what I would know as the birth to three program. Yes. And it's from birth until age three. Yes, right. correct. And okay. then um, to add to that, and then probably the school will want to pick up, this is called um, Part C funding, um, federally and state funded. Uh, and so basically 90 days before the child turns three, they are given a transition meeting, which means that they meet with their family resource coordinator, they meet with people that are important to them, the teachers that this child will soon have, and the school district picks up and evaluates them. From there on, they plan an IEP meeting with the family. So transition is really important, and it's hard on the families because from here on out, you may go from having three people in your home two times a week, therapists working with you, supporting you, walking you through, and then age three, they're gone. You're in the school system. Let me go from there. Would you say that there's been an impact on funding in the birth of three program or that it's ever been funded correctly? Absolutely. It's, um, it's, it's growing, children are growing. I just returned from the State Interagency Council. Um, funding is, is expected <coughs> sequestration. Um, they talked a little bit about percentage that was cut. We were allocated an additional 400,000 and I'm not sure exactly how this works, but basically for children we had, that's the amount we're supposed to get for children that we additionally have this year. And sequestration cut all that back. So now there isn't the funding for the children we have, plus no additional, it's gone totally reverse. And so we talked a lot about the um, program always having to shift pieces of the pie around to provide children with services. And there's just not enough providers. Uh, there's not enough funding for these providers. What's a provider? Um, thank you. It's a, an occupational therapist, which is a big one. There are there's one in town that I know of, and may not be have the uh, equipment needed for some of these children. There's Yakima um, Children's Village occupational therapist, physical therapist, um, up and coming ABA applied behavior analysis. Um, Students, or I'm mean, sorry, professionals coming up that have now been approved through Medicaid uh, for coverage that they find is a great source for children with autism. Um, and then there's a whole slew of other things that, that you can be um, in touch with, but you know you don't always hear about those things because the state only has barely enough to get by with those providers providing the service in the home. How much speech therapy would a child normally get in a month? Typically, it just depends on from county to county. There's no um, framework set in each county. Every county is different. So it depends on how much funding your, your, your county has, but, and how, what your caseload is on kids. You may have a speech pathologist that's there once a week for an hour, every week of the month. You may have one that's there twice a week. The ideal amount for children on the spectrum, they're very, um, they want to give them intense services right away. That's where we found the most improvement as far as eye contact, as far as connection. That's the number one thing we work with first, is just getting them to connect, just that eye contact. So what is the ideal amount? Does oh, I mean, they, Wendy can uh, do it? Every day. It really is individualized. Okay. Every, it is. As you mentioned, Ralph, every single child, on the, every single, I don't even like to say children, I know all, all of us have parents, so we are all children. But this is a lifespan issue. And so all individuals with autism or who are on the spectrum have different needs. They're all they're as different among each other as we are in this room. They're all different. I work with young men with autism who are extremely vertical. They're in their 20s, they've had a lot of work, they've been through good special ed programs, they're very vertical. But there are some people who never develop. So when we first get a diagnosis and we're in classic, I mean, per, they don't really know at age three what what you're dealing with. I mean, we know Asperger's versus classic, but what what would be if you were going to deal with classic autism, nonverbal, with a young child, age two, about what would you recommend? Just for speech, speech therapy. Yep. How many I hours? Like, well, here's what we do know: if you give a child ten hours a week of behavioral therapy, they could include behaviors, speech, whatever it is, you will get a certain amount of growth. If you give them 40 hours a week, which was done
done, huh, this is not new research, it goes back to the 1960s, you get huge improvements. So the more they get, the more development, the more progress you see. So you said about 10, and I mean, let's just take a look. 10 is very okay. common. So what, what would a child be? Again, it goes county to county. It goes yeah, county. I mean, once we see have a child come in with the diagnosis, they try to prioritize that because they do see so much tremendous growth with more training for the parents. And the way you get the parents on board is you're in that home as much as you can be. And you're really relaying to them, this is what you need to be doing. I mean, a lot of it is time intensive with that whole family. So ideally, one, I mean, every day in the home. But what do they really get? Uh, probably twice a week. Well, in, in this work, when we discuss, I almost hate doing this about autism, I'll be honest with you, because the special needs community includes all of us and we're all in the same room. We never got, we're, we're sitting here thinking of an 82, did your son get more than an hour a week in the public school? That's like no, 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 we're talking birth to three. Okay, that's we're talking home environment. Yeah, birth to three. Birth to three. Birth to three. Birth to three. So birth to three here, you wouldn't get 10 hours a week. Uh, at the time, my son, I, we were, it was very small and I was fortunate. We had a speech pathology just in once a week. For an hour, we have an occupational therapist um, twice a week at first. Physical occupational therapist. So the so idea here is speak. you've got this child who can have some great outcomes. Obviously, the more input you get, the better outcome. And as a civilization and a society, you're going to be paying a lot. Mm -hmm. um, being interesting to find out what the school system has paid for my son to have a one on one aid while he's there versus what could have been paid up front and avoided all that. But this is lifespan. So what the, the, the small inputs we put up front, and I'm preaching to the choir because I know all of you know this. The more we put up front, we wouldn't have to deal with 90% of this. And actually, a lot of the outcomes, the birth to three out programs, is they, they transfer out. They don't need birth to three. Not with autism necessarily, but with most of the people who have autism. Yeah. A lot of times yeah. they'll catch. Kind of awesome program. So we're going to transition. <laughs> um, we're going to go to the school system. Um, so you guys actually, here's a system. You actually get a handout here. Right? We have to find her. And by the way, it would be nice if. The doctor passed it on, but my doctor's in Seattle. He didn't know who to pass it on. They just send you out the door with a packet that says you should get 40 hours with ABA. There is no one in this county that I'm aware of that's trained in ABA, specifically that's working with individuals here. Um, there are people at Central who are being trained to, but none of them, as I understand it, work within our outside community. And that's nothing bad about Central, but it is something Interesting. Something we might want to talk about. I'm the only one, but I'm not certified. Yeah, you right. have to be board certified. That's right. 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 to, to charge. Sure. sure. I don't charge. Yes, <laughs> ma'am. I'm a faculty from Central Washington, and oh. it's my second year. Yeah, so I'm both certified. Just let everybody know that. So what we want is you in our schools. Right? <laughs> yes. Because it doesn't mean no good to have the brain trust at Central. Yes, I also got to have a connection because it's kind of weird because I'm a foreigner and new to this community. And after I was a teacher uh, in Taiwan for 15 years, probably you cannot tell, that's good. <laughs> um, so my first job is to teach students with autism in a kind of giftedness school. So it's kind of weird to me, so that's why I get into my master, my doctoral degree because of autism, yeah. So just let you know I'm here, and if you need anything, any cooperation from me, I'm welcome, and yeah. <laughs> so the, and this is what this whole point is, is what can we do in the community to interlink with each other? Um, your students currently are training where, when they get? My students are doing internships across the spectrum and across many different disabilities. How about geographically? Well, geographically, we have students on the west side, we have students Valley. We have students working here in Ellensburg. Um, we have students available to the schools. We have one student working in the middle school right now here in Ellensburg um, doing internship hours. Um, the nice thing when you have interns, you don't always have to pay for them. Especially if 
it's local. So. I think most people would pay for them. We just can't get them. So that um, is so a real we, opportunity. Great, great, wonderful. This is what it's all about. <laughs> hey, I've been trying. I've been trying. All right, so let's move down the road. So now we're in the school. We're four years old. Um, what happens now? Well, a variety of things. Um, it could be just can, it can be continuing the speech services, occupational therapy services, um, you know, the outreach program that we've talked about, or it could be where your child requires um, maybe some developmental preschool and um, where they're going every day for two, two and a half hours, and where they're, um, you know, in, a, in, in an environment with other students, so they're getting that socialization that um, is really important, the early, early interventions that um, everybody has talked about. Um, with Garrett, um, we, I, I worked with um, Rolla Vickers, who um, many of you know, and had some other students of parents in there. And um, she was kind of ahead of the game. She knew some things that we could try um, that were specific for children with autism that she was already trying to put into place. Because um, she did recognize a little bit of the um, classic autism indicators in Garrick. And so um, working at, a, at an early age with him, um, it was really interesting to see um, now, as he's becoming an adult, the things that she started with him early, um, they're starting to come out in him. Um, other, it, and, it, and it depends on geographically um, what you do. We are a smaller district and we don't have a developmental preschool, so we did have to partner with Ellensburg and um, provide services with Ellensburg. And so, um, but there's nothing wrong with that because, um, you know, it's just more people uh, helping out that child. Um, it just gave them, it gave them more opportunities. Um, so, or we're hoping that they've already had the group, the three, that they were found in that uh, program, and, and if not, then, you know, then you've got to start doing what the, birth, the three kids have already been doing. And so what is the, I want you to say IEP, um, so how do I get Oh, to okay, yeah, so um, you, you meet as a team, and if they have speech therapy and occupational therapy, and your school psychologist, and your, um, if it's the developmental preschool teacher, uh, you meet as a team and you develop an IEP for that child that is an individualized plan um, on how you, you know, you're gonna set the goals of where you want your child to be. And so um, we, we have these little steps inside those goals on um, specific areas we target that we want to bring that child up to a specific level. And um, that IEP is worked on all year, and then we meet again as a team. And parent input is important. Anybody that works with your child, that input is also important. Um, but it's important to put it together as a team. So you're listening to the parents' needs, the parents' concerns, um, the parents' goals, as well as what the school community feels uh, like as a goal for the child as well. So an IEP is an individual education program, mm -hmm. and they are really um, interesting documents. I just got done hours ago <laughs> doing mine for next year with Madonna and the team. But they are, they're written, in Garrick's case, something like to walk independently for 10 yards <coughs> with prompts 10% of the times by this date, and then to walk this far independently with these kinds of prompts, this is the kind of steps they're working on. Um, again, we're talking about classic. Asperger's would be completely different, but these IEPs are kind of what we live and die by in the schools, right? Um, and so sometimes it doesn't seem like they go the way we want, 
Um, as parents, we don't understand things. Um, for example, I want um, summer school. Yeah, it's, it's so you're, you're, and I'm not trying to be confrontational right. here, yeah. but <laughs> there's resources that are not available. Um, so I want a one-on-one -on -one aid for my son. Um, these are things that happen in IEPs, right? Yep. So, and I know there's lots of, a couple of people here who work with IEPs from the school standpoint. What should we know as parents going into those? What should we do? How can we be better prepared to help you help our children? Well, one of the things is that um, we are, special education is funded and you're funded up to 12% of your student population. Right now, for example, the class is a little above 15%. So you're not being funded for, half, you know, for all the other students that qualify to be in our classroom. So when you're trying to pay for one-on-one -on -one aids for students, um, or like in our elementary, there's um, two students that require one-on-one, -on -one, and then um, there's aids inside that elementary classroom. So in order to provide the services for the small group instruction when they're coming in, um, so our monies only go so far until, you know, really we don't have any. And when we sit down, we have to, you know, budget what all of our aids are going to be and what all the supplies are that we need for um, our children for the next um, school year. So at the end of the school year, we don't have the funds for extending school year. In the past, when um, special education was given a little bit more money, uh, you know, we could bring kids in early before school started for, say, three weeks. Um, we don't have the funding to do that. Um, we would love to figure out a way to, um, you know, like we work with Elmview Vocational Services in our transition program. We would love to have the money to be able to take their uh, out to tr the trellis program out in the pocket. Um, but the funding is just not available for us to do everything we would what, what kind of funding, and I, you may not have the answer, but so if you have a child who has IEP, what kind of funding do you get for the state, above and beyond? And I, I, don't, I don't have that. Does anyone have a rough idea? Bill. Bill's been the latest What kind of funding is received by the school district for a child with, um, on an IEP? Is it always the same amount? Yes. There is a couple ways that money is collected. And birth to three is a different yes. formula that comes in apportionment, and it is a school district program. Uh, part C is different than part B. Part B is three to 21. So on the matter of how much money comes in, there's a little variation in formula. We would say about, because there's federal money that comes from IDEA, that's, uh, we came back out, I guess it's about, I'd say about a thousand. And then there's money that comes from the state. Directly, what you get for every kid is the same. If a child registers on our November 1 count, there's a formula that there's an allocation. And then there's a state allocation that comes in a portion that is for any, any kid, anybody that's, in, that's enrolled. So that amount of money is available. 5000 you know, I usually break it down that way. And, but, so then in the program, and money is allocated in, in special education and budgets put together and all that. So the money that's available is interesting. Is first, is it just differences in understanding. And I don't really go into finance with parents. What I talk about is what is needed to deliver the appropriate program. Never do. But so just the, the picture, and I want it to sound entirely like entirely like whining, but it goes like this. We get the same amount of money for any kid. So we have a kid that really gets an hour's worth of speech a week, a couple half hours to get that art cleaned up, and they're in business and exit, and we never see them again. They're fixed. They're done with us. And then we have kids who have one-on-one -on -one aids, 
and you know, maybe medically fragile, we need nursing services, we need the one on one aid, and that can go up. The state of the wisdom decides the threshold, because this is where more money comes in. So we get the allocation, and it's supposed to even out. Um, I don't think so. But anyhow, we get the allocation, we get a standard amount of money, and then what happens is, where they have a safety net application that the state of Washington has set aside an amount of money from the federal allocation that comes in IDEA, and districts that have, when you have a really high needs kit, you can put together the IDP and make the request of the Office of the Public Instruction to give more money, to give you more money. So that threshold is $26,000. So after we spend $26,000 on, on, on a child, and the state decides that, yeah, we can write out 25, we can write out you know, 20,000 on every kid that gap, then we can apply for more money. And sometimes when we have a perfect IEP and have submitted it, uh, and it's approved, we would get additional money. Uh, we write off 20,000, that we absorb 20,000, and then we can get additional money back from the state. And that amount varies annually. It's not guaranteed to continue. Uh, but we did safety net applications. We did nine this year. So there's some money invested there. We submitted them. We could get, we'll get somewhere between 140 that we submitted for that is over 25,000 times nine. So are you talking per child when you say 25,000 dollars? Yes, that's what we absorb. Before we can even ask the state, okay. 5,000 coming in, 20,000 on top of that, the threshold to apply is $26,000. So it's back, say 21 we absorb. And then we could get additional money in safety net for some high cost kids. And maybe we do, maybe we don't. Um, it's, um, it's obviously as complicated as it sounds. Um, that there is no dollar like it's this. It's a bunch of different things. BEA funds, and then you, every child gets BEA. It's basic. And so I'm going to pull this back because I don't think that's terribly. I don't think it's going to help us here. So we get the same amount of money for every kid, and then where services are delivered is where does it take to implement that IP? Where does it take to deliver those services? And going to the I'm in process right now with projections for next year, and they're very close discussions with teachers of the more significantly disabled kids because that's where there are one on one aids. There are some kids who need, you know, uh, a great deal of supervision, total array of services. You know, it varies, but that's what we're, we're doing right now to gear up for next year. Sure, sure. So let's go back to the IEP. I'm sorry, I got on my tangent. So what, what could a parent do that would make an IEP better? What should we be aware of when we go into an IEP? Um, well, hopefully, you the parent has been contacted to give their input before we create an IEP. So it doesn't leave you with, what should we know going into it? Hopefully, you've been part of the team, so you know what to expect, that you've had, you know, any questions or concerns or additions have been completely addressed before we even have that IEP meeting. Um, so you're going to, um, you know, hear your child's diagnosis. We're going to give you present levels of your child's performance, um, how they're doing functionally, um, socially, academically. Um, you're going to hear our, what the goals and the objectives are. Um, if you're receiving any kind of services such as speech or OT, they will have their own goals um, to share with you. And, and then we'll share how many minutes your child is receiving um, our services and how it's broken up. So again, hopefully um, your IP team has talked with you enough that you don't feel overwhelmed going into, which I know doesn't happen all the time. Um, so, I, you know, our teachers, they're, they're always open for phone calls or, um, you know, meetings or whatever to help um, ease your concerns before you come in. They do sometimes sound confrontational and I think sometimes they're scary. I know from my perspective, these are the people you have to work with. I mean, it's this or nothing. So if you don't work with them, you're just burning your own ridges. Um, and 
there's lots of different experiences and so forth, but, um, go ahead. Okay. Well, actually, with, with our IEP meetings, I found it um, to be really a little more comforting, I would have Gretchen from Central Washington Disability Resources come with me to my IEP meeting. Um, because that would, that would let the school know I, I have support, I have somebody that knows the law because I, I didn't know the law. You know, I remember her first IEP meeting getting that and then, okay, sign at the end. And you're going, um, okay. <laughs> you know, I didn't know that you didn't have to sign at that time. I didn't know that you were allowed to take the IEP home and, and read it over and highlight things and make changes. Um, and so, so having somebody that had been through the ringer, basically, um, to be supportive and say, hey, you know, this sounds really good. Um, let's take it back, let's read it over, was helpful for me, definitely. And I think that from the other side, something educators might want to understand is these are kids. So, we're, I mean, we're one, overwhelmed, we're scared to death, we don't understand the process. It is a lot of words and a lot of things that written in a format that is pretty foreign to those of us that don't do that. And so, understanding on both sides will get us a long way. So we all want the same thing, in my opinion. But it is a scary process for parents. Bigger things. Um, so, like for example, the trellis program, um, it's something that we felt that Garrett would like to do. So we went out and observed it, and then we brought some of their components in as part of his program so that he was learning the skills that they're learning. Um, one thing that he always did like to do when he was littler was rip paper. And so with vocational services, um, working in the recycling program, that is one of the things that he is doing and seems to be doing really well in it. Um, so it's, it's again, taking a good look at who your student is and what their interests are and trying to build a program that, like Rolf said today, um, ideally they would like to have Eric where he is um, employable and wanted by an employer and where Eric has an everyday job that he goes to and he's making his <coughs> living. So you really have to work on um, what kind of skills can you teach this child that is going to get them to this point of transitioning into life after high school? And so at 15, that's when you start looking at it. So when they turn 16, that program is in place. And so um, some kids who um, have autism and go on to college, it might be, you know, helping them fill out their financial aid forms or doing college tours and setting up um, any of the services that they're going to need once they get out of high school and go on to college. Um, other students, it's going to be a slower process and every year it's, you know, you got the end of the day figured out, now let's get the middle of the day figured out um, at, at their job. So. Um, some students are going to take quite a bit longer to um, reach their goal and then <coughs> other students are. But again, it's important uh, working with your outer agencies um, to prepare your students for that. So Jim, have we bumped into your world yet on our <coughs> attorney here? Bumped all around it. <laughs> <laughs> Now it's the Developmental Disabilities Administration. Things change. Um, in working with parents, working with our clients, uh, it's it, it, it's not any different to, at times of what we're doing and what our vendors who provide services are doing than, than what we saw happening in the schools. You've got people who are really committed. They're trying to move uh, each of the individuals forward uh, as best they can with the limitations that they have. Um, we're talking about parents being prepared for IEP. You know, one of the things I think is a real mindset change that parents have to embrace. Child has an entitlement in special ed, but that entitlement is, is to a program that's designed to be a benefit. But we always want the best benefit. The 
best benefit is always what may be appropriate for the school to provide because they're trying to do that for everybody. And so that, that's a mindset becomes, okay, I can't always get everything I want, but I still want the best that I can get. And so there, there's two things in, in that as parents. One is we are so afraid sometimes of change. We're afraid of the unknown. And we want that security that we know this is going to work, we're going to move to this next step, and that's going to work, and it's going to take us to the next step. And when we're working with individuals with disabilities, that isn't always a logical sequence. And we have to embrace the idea that we're going into the unknown, because what we do a lot is trial and error, both as parents, as educators, as vendors on the job site. It's trying to find that unique blend of what works for that person. And if it was a cookie cutter thing we could do, we wouldn't be here tonight because it's all solved then. But it's not solved. Every day is a new experience, a new exploration. That's just as true when they become adult clients as it was when they were going through the school system. So that's a real mental thing that we, we, we struggle with both as parents and as educators. When I worked in the school district, I really felt blessed. With the, with the teachers and the therapists and the psychologists that we had to work with. I was in awe of, of the effort that they put forward and what they had to work with. They were so um, innovative in, in trying to make the best out of what they had, coming up with ideas I'd never heard before. Uh, it was wonderful. Now I'm, I'm outside that realm um, and I'm working with some of the clients I have now, but my high school students, or students who came through preschool to graduation when I was the special ed director in Ellensburg. You know, so it's a good history with families and to see how far some of them have come. It's really um, a success story to look at what they're doing. But we still face the same challenges. When you get to the world of state services, now you're beyond IDEA. State services are not an entitlement. They're just a service. And as there are two qualifiers, number one, they have to meet the eligibility requirement. And when you're in special education within school systems, you know, there's like 15 different categories you can qualify under. When you get to my world, there's only four. And so the scope narrows tremendously on who we can work with. Classic autism is one of them. Asperger's is not. So when we look at the, uh, the spectrum, it's only that one niche that qualifies for services under developmental disabilities. Now, within that niche, we're facing the same challenges that, that the teachers that have been there before and the therapists that have been there before, we're still looking at. I'm a gatekeeper in my role. You know, I do an assessment that determines what type of service needs they have for adult daily living skills, for doing their laundry, for cleaning their apartment, for cooking their meals, for getting medications, for taking care of hygiene. And we, uh, as a gatekeeper then, provide for providers who can help aid them in those, those types of things. In the employment world, there are vendors in each county that have contracts to address employment occupational issues. And my role is to say, go see them. You know, that's their job. Um, and, and so uh, things get a little bit different. I think when you're going through the school system, it's a more holistic approach because you're really looking at that child developing and everything's happening socially, emotionally, educationally, all the way through school. When they get to be adults, you know, a lot of the feathers and fluff is gone. And uh, when, when they're talking about putting a transition program together in the schools, whether you're looking at it at a 12-year-old, a 15-year-old, a 16-year-old, you know, you're really looking at what, like LaDonna said, you've got to know when that kid exits the door, they've got to have some skills to survive because the entitlements are gone, a lot of the what we might consider hand-holding are gone, they're adults, and they don't know how to survive. So it just opens up a whole new world now. And I'll take that a little bit farther, we'll keep going through all these transitions, you know, everything's a transition, to services, to the different levels, through the school system, out of the school system, to adult services. Another transition that parents need to be woefully aware of, and some aren't, I can't take care of this child for the rest of my life. Somebody else is going to have to step into that role. And that again is the unknown, the change. Sometimes it's so hard to let go of and look to the future, to what's going to be best for that individual. 
you know, so that's, that's a real little slip and hold seat there. Um, because that, that's very important. As our parents are aging, all of a sudden they have a lot of parents now that need some attention. And they can't do the things necessary as they've always done for that child. And so you're doing your child a real favor at times by saying, you know what? I can't be your favorite favor forever. We need to look to the future so that you're set up. And that, that talks about guardianship, powers of attorney, it talks about direct services, living arrangements, the whole bit. Jim, you brought up a lot of stuff that I'd like to yeah. interrupt for just a second. So really, the school system is there until what age? Is it 18? The school system is there, they can exit at 18 if they want, they could exit at 16 if they wanted to. We are encouraging students to stay involved with their school systems because of the entitlement until age 21. So that's the age, is 21 we exit that entitlement program? If they start the school year at age 20 and turn 21 two weeks later, they're still entitled to that whole school year. So that's something a lot of people may not understand, but our kids tend to be there until age 21 if you ask. Now at age 21, they're going home, right? And yeah. they're going home and they're sitting in at home when they used to be at school. And it's really important to think about the 18 to 21 issue. If they exit school at 18, which socially they like to do that when all their friends graduate, they're going to sit for three years with no services because the state will not look at them until they turn 21. That's why it's important to keep them involved with that IEP, even if it's an occupational transition IEP for three years, so that they're connected, they're still involved, they're still getting some supports. Then at 21, that last transition, we get together how they do them, what they've been doing, we, walk, we have vendors there, what type of things we look at. That's a much easier transition to be through than somebody who's been sitting home watching TV for three years and doesn't want to work now. In the end, the primary care provider and the person responsible for these children are the parents. Um, that's, that is the truth. And at age 21, it's a very interesting story. So I've got, what did I hear today? We did the math. Four years, right? So I've got four years. So I have to figure out how to semi-retire in four years because my wife cannot be with my son all the time. And he probably isn't going to work an eight-hour day. So what's he going to do the rest of the time? This is reality. It's a four-year reality. And that's forever after that. Now, there's things we can do, and we better do them. Um, because sitting in front of a TV all these, the rest of his life, except for the two hours he goes to work, is not a very pretty option. But these are the realities that people face. Also, it's interesting to think of the siblings. I'm not going to live forever. Yeah? So what do you think my daughter's thinking? Oh, boy. That's a reality. Oh, do we have any siblings in the room that are willing to? I mean, it's, that's a big thing to say. But I know my daughter thinks about that in her relationships. Again, she's in college. But she thinks, I'm going to have to tell whoever, my significant other, that's my brother. He is my responsibility at some point. Um, this is something you have to deal with, or we can't go down this road. Well, it, yeah. or there's no siblings. Yes. I think, I think there is, now there is an option in Washington State to have um, a private home. Um, Sunridge is actually the first private home in Washington State where um, young adults with autism can actually come together and buy parcels of the home. So they actually own the home. So all of their state dollars goes to the home. So their parents, after fronting that first amount of money, no longer have to put money into it. The state fully funds them. So none of that money goes back to the state, it goes directly to the house parents or the caretakers. Obviously there's other things set in place in case these caretakers weren't um, wanting to continue to be part of it. They have basically a two-year program is what it is, and it's an interval. So there are options like that out there now. Um, those are people that you may want to get in contact with um, at the Sunridge website, and it, they will help you through that and help you uh, find out and figure out how to do it um, on a scale that works for you and um, obviously, uh, possibly other young adults with autism and other families. It's a really good program and set up <coughs> because most of your young adults with autism don't want to live with you the rest of your life as much as we'd like to think that. They grow up too, they want to 
they want to be independent just like everybody else. So it's an important part to look at, and then also those transitional programs. So, Maddie, you're with Sunridge and Trellis. Yeah, I Sunridge is a, a home that was developed by a parent um, from the coast um, who, <laughs> who, who, who developed their own system, who figured out how to make this work. But again, it's the parent's responsibility to figure that out. And they've developed, it's really cool, and you can go up there and I believe you still give tours and yes. it's amazing. But there are lots of interesting ways to do this, but as parents you have to be figuring this out. And you've got to get all the pieces put together and figure out how to make it work. Because it does have to work forever after you're gone. But a um, great thing is it's a great model. If you go out there, it's a great model. They're, they're able to walk us through everything. They're able to talk to you about how to get it started on a scale that works for you and how to do all that stuff. So that's a perfect, perfect uh, resource to look for. Nice. Rolf, I go with a, uh, a sibling that has special needs, mm -hmm. and both my parents are deceased. And that, that is a very interesting, you know, I, I never really thought about it because it was just something that was automatic. But um, I imagine that has been very hard on the rest of our family, you know. And one thing that I found with the new laws, what I consider new laws, all the privacy laws, um, so my sibling and I deal with is older than me, about 10 years older than I am. And I was his main caregiver when my mother passed away. And um, anyway, we set him up and he is in a home in Bellingham or he assisted living in Bellingham. But what I found was really interesting is um, as I took care of him and made sure his medications and everything was taken care of, uh, with the new privacy laws. So this has happened twice now in the last few years. So he's 60 years early. Um, he's been in the hospital. Nobody to advocate for him. None of us knew he was sick because they would not call us. He was, had major surgery. Was in the hospital two weeks. Almost died. None of us were informed. I mean, it was, it's, a, it's something. So here's our night. Um, let's move on and talk with Elmview, who has a lot of pieces. Um, and so at some point, you may or may not work with the school system with transition into employment. Is that correct? That is correct. Um, I just got to be thinking, it. when I worked at Head Start, my first job, I, I worked with a lot of parents. So I, as I, we're going up the line, you can see where all the little barriers are going to be. By the time your, your child was diagnosed, they're almost at that age of three, and so they're too old for birth research services. They've already missed out. And it's not that we don't have good physicians, we do, but you know, it's just one of those kinds of things that's kind of iffy initially, especially when children look the same. You know, they, you can't see anything obvious, like with a Down's child, which would easily get into a birth of three program because that's very easy to see. Then the birth of three program, it doesn't have very many funds. And so, and how many more people do we have now? When I first started at Head Start in the early 80s, we didn't see an autistic kid. When I left there at the end of eight, uh, in the beginning of the 90s, we were starting to see one a year, then two a year. And so you know the amount of people are, are getting bigger and bigger. We go into the school systems where we're getting overburdened with all these kids. We don't have enough funds. Everybody's, you know, everybody has a good heart and is trying to do what they can. But everything down the line, there's places where we're going to have some mistakes. We're working with parents that are very upset because we can't get the services that they need. Then they come into the transition program, and we work with schools, we work with kids at 16. And the first thing we say to the parents is, oh my God, have you applied for Social Security? Are you making a plan for the future? Have you thought about what's going to happen to them when they leave school? Because they're already 16, and you know, you only have five years to get some of these things in, you know, in your head. Have you thought about, are they going to be their own guardian? Are you going to be the guardian? How many guardians are they going to have? Where are they going to live? You know, what kind of jobs do they like? What kind of things do they like to do? Because what we're trying to build is life skills, you know. We are trying to make people commodities so they can get a job. And what's everybody's first job? 
fast food. I mean, who didn't start in fast food or babysitting or doing some of those kinds of jobs? You start at the bottom. And we have a lot of kids that want to start with, I want to be a secretary. Well, you might want to be a secretary, but your first job is probably going to be this. And so we have to start somewhere, just like everybody has to start somewhere, because we're working with people with barriers. I don't care. I mean, there are all kinds of barriers. Maybe you don't talk very well. Maybe your communication is too much. I mean, there's all sorts of barriers. It's a gigantic spectrum of things, from, because we work with all sorts of people. And if they start using drugs, that's a huge barrier because nobody wants to hire somebody that's using drugs recreationally. And so, you know, we know that people have a lot of skills, they can learn a lot of things, but the clock is ticking. You're 16, we've got five years. What are we going to get done in those five years? Some people take longer. So we always strongly encourage people stay in school till you're 21. The schools are the first payers. You're going to go to an adult system that's not going to welcome you with open arms like the school did. They're going to say, sorry, you know, there might be services for you, but we'll put you on a list. We'll see. We don't know. You can't, I mean, even getting into our system, that's the gatekeeper in the, into our system. You, you're trying to figure out where you're going to, you know, is there support for your child to live out in the community, you know. We have, we have people that have been in, you know, they get 24-hour care. We've got people that get two hours a week and just need help with grocery shopping. But e even for us to get referrals into residential programs, we're not even seeing that because the state is really tight with the dollars. There just isn't the funds available for people to have those kind of services. There's a little bit, but not very much. And so it really does who is going to be ultimately responsible. It's going to be parents that are going to have to try to figure out things like, are there things like the Sunrise Ranch where you can get together <coughs> with other people and try to make it work? I mean, this is our community. You people are our community. We grew up here. We live here. This, we will have to try to figure it out. State dollars are not going to get bigger. They're only going to get smaller. And we, are, as a group, have to try to figure out how to make this work. You know, I can't solve every problem. I can solve a few, but I can't fix everything. We want people to work because people need to work to be part of their community. People need to have, you know, this is our community. It's important to be a part of the community. And, you know, everybody has different skills. And so... People working is huge. I, <laughs> well, and huge. It's what we all do to receive value as people. And the value that comes from these people working in our businesses is so tremendous. I, and it always is very discouraging to me because it is difficult, I'm an employer, so I kind of get what this is like, but the benefits I've had by working with Elmu and, and special me, it's huge. I have people that say the day he quits, I quit. Um, it, it's just huge, but I don't think we understand how important work is and finding a way to make this work, because everybody should work. And there's people in this room whose kids need work, but they can't find it. Well, I just wanted to say, as well, as, while we're on the topic of work and employment, that some, I think in some communities, the goal is to get these individuals employed and working and contributing. But we're not very creative in terms of seeing what they're actually able to do. Personally, I don't like the word disabled. I like the word differently able. Right. And these individuals do not want to hold towels for six hours a day. These people want jobs where they really contribute. That's one of the reasons why Sunridge works so well. Agricultural life for these individuals is a really rich environment for them. On if the other hand, there are place, people that would kill to be able to hold towels. There are some people who <laughs> This is true. Towels, but the goal here is to find out what else can that person don't plug someone into a single job. View them as you would any other employee. Look for ways to promote them, whether it's up to another position, rotating positions. Keep their lives as rich as we would want them to be rich. And that's one of the ways that you can really make a difference if you are an employer in this community. Yeah, I just wanted another expectation. Sometimes when parents are, are contemplating the future of their child, they say, oh, the state will provide this, do it for that. 
The state does not. And it's really important to understand when we work with our clients, they're paying their own rent, they're buying their own food, they are paying their own utilities, and if they are not working, then that is just, is that just a $700 SSI payment they get a month or an $800 payment? That working, even if it's only a few hours a day, adds considerably to the quality of life that they will have. It's a fixed income, it's not rich. You know, just ask any senior how easy it is to live. So at LPU, you have two kind of pieces. You have a jobs piece, mm -hmm. and then you also have or a residential or housing piece. Right. Um, and so I come to you at some point as a parent and say, what, what can we do with Garrett? And then you go to Jim and you guys talk, or how does that work? Well, we, we don't just talk about you. We like to talk with you. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, he's not my kid. He's yours. So right. let's talk about, and he needs to be part of this too, if at all possible, because I don't want to make plans for somebody else. I, I, my kids don't listen to me, so why would you are? So okay, but my son to, isn't going to. Yeah, he so probably you, isn't right, going to be but, in but, the but you're a good resource, and the school is a good resource, and the case manager. It's a group of people that we start to sit down and say, what are we going to do? What's the plan? Where do we start? You know, what are his interests? What are his skills? You know, how can we build? Because, again, nobody wants, you know, some people like to fold towels all the time. Some people may not ever want to. Right. But we have to learn some work skills where you have to show up on time. And, you, you know, so we have some structured activities so that we can build some of those skills so that we can go out. Some people want to work in the community. They want to find their you know, their peers, their peeps, they go out to do that. And some people don't, they don't want to have that, you know, they don't want to be out there. They want to be maybe at the, at the ranch or, you know, where it's their community, it's small, they don't have to worry about others. You know, everybody's different. We just have to figure out what it is people want. We, unfortunately now, when we start to do an assessment with a person, we have to look at, pers at the person's weaknesses which is entirely horrifying for us as in, you know, Elmview employees to look at people's weaknesses. We've never liked to do that, but that's kind of the way the programs are now. You have to look at what the weaknesses are so we know how many hours that we're gonna get to support this person. And so then based on those hours, we try to, you know, we only get so many per person and they definitely shrunk. So then there's some limitations with that and then we try to figure out, okay, well, we've got this many hours, what can we do? And we have some very creative people like Linda and Sherry Powers, and there's a variety of people there, and we just start trying to figure it out. So there is a lot of creativity that's involved in it, but I, I, you know, one of the things that I want to mention too is that not everyone just comes into a vocational program, and we work on job readiness skills like attendance, writing resumes, um, interviewing skills. But some of that can be the behaviors as well that, that need to be addressed and uh, modified in such a way so that they can be out in the public um, working in their community, which they have a right to do. Um, one of the things, I, I've been listening to everybody talk and I've had so many comments, um, but um, a couple things I wanted to touch on. Uh, I came from King County, Coastie. <laughs> so I, I, I've heard it a little bit. I guess my saving grace might be that my family's been in Upper County almost 40 years. Um, one of the things over in King County, they're talking about the transition program. Uh, in King County, they have put together a, a modified transition program for the kids called Jobs by 21 or um, uh, School to Work um, in Snohomish and King County. What, the kids, when they enter into this program, they enter in their last year of transitioning, meaning they will be turning 21 in their last year. What you guys have here is that they're starting at 16, like, like your son with Elmview. So getting them earlier, that's the key right there. Um, because, you know, I'm going to compare to the other side, but over there, uh, by the time we get them, we're just getting one year of information from them. We don't get a lot of information from the schools. So therefore, we're doing a lot of figuring out ourselves. So the 16 is filling that gap there. Um, but also, in all of this, um, 
you as parents are advocates for your children. You know, you're, you're building that path for them to be successful in life, and you're learning how to put the links together through the birth to three, um, then from there on all the way up to the transitioning. And there, there's a lot of unknowns for parents. And one of, one of the things that um, I would imagine that would be scary is that, okay, now your kid's done with school, um, now what? And you don't, you don't understand um, the services, uh, you know, like what Jim does. And you don't know the questions to ask. You don't know where to go. Um, one of the things that I've told parents that have just been blank on what to do with their kids is, is question, question, question. No stupid question. Ask it, ask it. If you don't think it's satisfying, go to the next one. And, and that's, what, that's what, as parents, that's what you do as an advocate for them. But also, as, as vendors that work with individuals with disabilities, I would hope that, um, well, in schools and whatnot, I would hope that there would be a passion within each individual that works in this field, um, because there is a lot of work that's put into it. Um, I, uh, uh, I really believe that every person has their own individual path, and every person comes with a team. And every team looks different. Uh, it could be siblings, it could be parents, it could be guardians, uh, case managers, um, psychologists, whatever. Um, but every person has, holds a key to the success of that person. Um, so that's what you look for. And the folks that we work with have that right to be in their community, to work in their community. And what that looks like on our part in the employment is that we go out into the community, we talk to employers, we advocate for our folks, we educate employers on not just disabilities, but the skills and the abilities of the individuals. Like when you're talking about folding towels, some people want fold towels, you know? Some people, you know, want to fall, fill salt and pepper shakers. But then other people have bigger pictures. But again, it goes to that individualized path for that person, what skills and abilities that they have, and how you can grasp those and build on those to enhance them to be productive within their community. Thank you. So I know we've run way longer than I said it was, but I can't stop now because there's something that's really important that we've got to touch on, and that's first responders. Um, and there's, I, if you guys saw the list, you guys are probably all like qualified to think I'd go through it because we've gotten here now. And this goes this long. But again, this first responder is too important, and there's too many key people here to let this go. So, Corey, tell me, you know where I want to go with this idea. So it's, it's. Does Claire always stay right where she needs to be? <laughs> no. So what does Claire sometimes do? She likes to disappear and wander off. And so she shows up where? Neighbor's houses that aren't home. In their houses. In their On their cars. beds. Okay. So now Claire is nonverbal or, okay. So you've got a nonverbal child. What, what time of day might this be? When we're really busy and not paying attention. Okay. Um, so now there's a child walking down the street, about this big, nonverbal, walking around. You're driving down in your squad car, and you see this child. What is she doing? What would she? Is she just plodding along, or are we gonna just go? Hmm, that's kind of odd. Um, she'll be making weird noises. She'll be smiling and not looking at cars or she'll just be. Could she possibly be in the middle of the street? Oh, she will be. Okay, so in the middle of the street, we have this small child walking down, kind of sounding. And she's probably looking for water. We used to give her some. So you no, run into her. Oh, look, you did jump into some. Yes. Okay. So yeah. This city, I purposely do not drive her by places because she remembers how to get there and she will run to the ground. So let's make this serious. In Yakima County, two children have left the school systems and ended up dead. 
in irrigation systems. That's in the last 10 years or so. This is real. I have a giant irrigation ditch across from me. This is real. So, Officer Coppin, you've run into this giant. What's going to happen? Well, obviously, first thing the officer's going to do is try to grab that child up on the sidewalk and find out where they live. And what's Claire going to do? So, he's going to approach Claire. What's Claire going to do? Scream at him and push him away. Yeah. Okay. And run into the road again. Okay. So now this is the situation you're dealing with. We're going to try to crowd that child back probably three or four times, okay? <laughs> and not catch him. Right? Right. I mean, how could he? I mean, this isn't, I mean, we understand. Um, so let's, I, I, my son does not carry a bracelet anymore, okay? So there's no identification on this child. You're going to eventually put him in a squad car and that's all going to go very well, we're going to say, and so forth. So then what are you going to do? You have a child that can't tell you anything. And really what's going to happen is we're going to take that child to our police station and we're going to see if there's any identification on the child, see if there's any uh, medical alert. And really what we're waiting for is that parent to call up and say, hey, my child's missing. Have you found it? And that's what happens 99% of the time. Sure. And uh, we understand that kids get away. But that happens, right? It happens with every child. So let's say it's at night and everyone happens to be sleeping. Um, and so Claire, my son, gets out at night, okay? He'll open the door and he'll go walk in. So you're not really supposed to lock people in houses, right? But you're also not supposed to let nonverbal children wander away at midnight. And at some point you do have to sleep, day three, day four. Interesting paradigms for parents to be in. So Claire gets out, it is night, they don't know she's out, three, four hours have gone by. If within, if not within a couple of hours, somebody is not called, what's going to happen is we're going to get hold of the Department of Social and Health Services, Child Protective Services, and say, we need to place this child somewhere, because we simply, if you don't know, I, I'm with the Ellsworth Police Department. Um, the police department at one given time, which we'll use today as an example, there are three officers on duty in uniform, in patrol cars. And if those two officers are domestic and those tied up on, with the child, they have to release this child to somebody so they can get back on to their friend mm -hmm. And so we will get hold of Child Protective Services and at that point they will probably house them in a temporary foster home or some safe location until we can contact a parent or a parent contacts us. And so now they're kind of in that system, right? Yes. And this isn't your system, this is their system. It's our system. Well, right, right. But I mean, it is separate from you. It is separate. And there are certain things that have to happen at that point, and they're not here to represent themselves, but obviously they have protocol. Yes. Um, and they're probably, I mean, they're just protocol. Please I come. have a question. Would it not be um, in their best interest if we had some kind of a roster down there at the local police department of all of our kids with their And I'm going to just oh. interject in that because you're okay. absolutely right. And one of the things that's come up is we as parents need to become educated on what they as officers need. Okay. Because it is our responsibility to do what it takes to provide the information you need. And there is a small group, Kathy Eidler is one, and some other parents who are working on this issue. But this is, I want you to know that this is real and this happens, mm -hmm. okay? Not like once every five years, much more frequent than that. And we need to work with you guys to figure out what you want. And we need to figure out the proper ways to do this and to work with the channels and so forth. Um, and why I go through this first responder thing, I'm not really trying to point out any faults here. I'm just trying to make sure we all understand the systems. Because there are systems, and they're the way they work. And there's, that's just the way they work. For example, so there is a group of parents working on ID braces. We're talking with KITCOM, and I will tell you, all parents here, if you call KITCOM or actually go to any police agency in Kittitas County, except Washington State Patrol that does not access KITCOM, you can go and you can say, I want to, this is my child, I live at this address, this is what you should know. They will also mark the child themselves, or the individual. So you've got your address marked, and you've got the individual marked, and they can pull that out. It's not perfect but they can put a note that they can look at. We've done this since Garrett was a wee kid. 
we're too dumb to share it with everybody because everybody should do this. Like tonight, everyone should unindate, don't call 911, okay? Call their non-emergency number and say, I have a special needs child and I want you to know this stuff. They know what bedroom he sleeps in. Now, this note, it does not just pop up, but it's there and they're working on getting it to pop up. So the question is, as parents, how do we get it so that they know it's our child? Um, well, first of all, write down this phone number if you have pen and paper. This is our dispatch number. It's 962-7676. That is KITCOM Communications. In each of our patrol cars is a laptop computer where we have this computer <coughs> dispatching system, which I can tell you, 25 years of police work, that's the greatest thing they're happened to us. Because right there in front of us, is a person's name, a description, and their photo. Can we used to never have this capability. The best before it was, we have somebody that's five foot two and they weigh 130 pounds. Okay. When that picture pops up, it's like, oh, not only do I can see this person, I know this person, I remember this person, <laughs> or it clicks. I saw this person right down the street. So, and I say this not just for children with disabilities. If you have a parent that has Alzheimer's, dementia, please contact our dispatch. If you can provide a photo to us, we can enter it into Spillman. Spillman is our computer program. We can enter it into enter the names file. Now here's the tough part is, is when you have a nonverbal child and they don't have their name on them or can't provide their name, how do we know who this child belongs to? Well, we can. It's, it's so this is our responsibility as parents. We can do something about that and we can talk about so they won't wear a bracelet. So let's talk with the officers and say we'll put it on this shoe. Let's do this for ourselves. We can do this as parents. I would also put out something slightly more interesting, well, different. So that works great in this county. And so on the, the bracelet you put, call 911 or something, but what if you're on vacation? Or what if you're driving through Yakima and something happens? When we think about this, we just need to think about a global system. But again, there are people working on this. I think you'll see something the next couple of months. We're working with KitCom. We want to work with the sheriff and the police department. But we want a global system. But this is very interesting, and this is something we can do to protect our kids. So I want to do another scenario. But I can't walk. Do you have anything else to say? Well, I, I do. <laughs> and, and that is, is, the good thing is, people so often try not to bother the police or first responders. They're, well, they're busy. I, I'll search. I'll look myself for 15, 20 minutes to try to find this person. Please don't hesitate to call anyone. I encourage you to call 911. You're not bothering us, you're not disturbing us. The more people we get searching sooner, and faster, and getting on it, and we don't care if you find them asleep in a, in a cubby spot that they like to go to in the house, it's, it's a big mistake. We don't care. Um, that's totally okay, and it's totally understandable. We just want to be there fast enough before something bad happens. And if you ever have a question, please contact me. Um, I will give you my work cell number if you have any questions. It is 201, it's a 509 area code, 201 I work a Monday through Friday, 8 to 4 position. Um, and if I don't pick up, leave a message. And I will get back to you as soon as I can. Um, if there's some way that I can help you with your child and, and communicate and using your needs to meet the police department, I can help you. Thank you. So I'm going to do a different scenario on you. All right, so now we're in school, and we have a child, and he's on an IEP, but something happened in his schedule. There's an aide today, okay? And normally this child walks a certain way to school, or in the hallways and so forth, but somehow something happened where this child that's going like this and going, ah, because that's what they do. But they went up to a girl and wrapped their arms around Okay? That girl was scared to death. Talks to her parents. Parents called the police department. My child was assaulted. <coughs> what do you have to do? When there is, well, for one, teachers in school, school professionals, doctors, nurses, police officers, firemen, are mandatory reporters. And, and there's quite a list of people that are mandatory reporters. What that means is mandatory reporters 
must report either to local law enforcement or to Child Protective Services an incident where there's a possibility, possibility of child abuse, uh, child assault, sexual abuse, list of, of things that can happen to a child. And so, to cover everybody's liability, they make the mandatory report. By the way, mandatory, mandatory reporters, this is the only law in the state of Washington that requires professionals to do something with criminal sanctions. Now, there's always civil liabilities that go on with not doing something or doing something in your profession. It's the only law that was mandated with criminal sanctions to do something. So that is the importance that the state has placed on it with the emphasis to professionals, this is what you must, must do no matter what. Or you could face losing your profession. So they will make a report to Child Protective Services or to the police department or both. And if it goes to Child Protective Services, that report will be reported to the police department for investigation. We'll sit down with the parties involved, uh, to try to get everybody's story to understand what happened. And in situations like this, there may very well be an assault report. But that's it. it it's an investigation to determine is this truly an assault or is this an event that doesn't really have criminal ramifications. It's um, so how do you determine that with a nonverbal individual versus a girl who is really scared? I mean, scared. Um, Garrett sometimes scares me, in all honesty. So how are you going to separate that out? Well, and that's where the law comes in. And this is actually where I'm trying to drive this. I want people to understand that this isn't necessarily in your control. It's not always in your control. In the state of Washington, anybody under the age of eight years of age cannot commit a crime. It doesn't matter if they commit a homicide, they kill somebody. A child under a certain age in the state of Washington cannot become guilty of a crime. Between the ages of 8 and 12, there's a possibility, depending on their abilities, and a court hearing to determine if they have the abilities to know that they can commit a crime, could be charged with a crime. And then above, uh, 12 and above, they can be charged with a crime, but then it depends on their, uh, their abilities. Um, and it, this is a court issue, though. That's I mean, it's got to go there. Okay. So again, we don't understand that because we think, well, this is ridiculous. This is my son. He's on an IEP. He has a diagnosis. They knew what should have happened, but something occurred. No one's fault, just something different occurred. But now my son's stuck in a system that is a system. This is the way it goes. But there are things that get that shouldn't happen in that system. That, and it starts right there with the police officer. The police officer determining, is this something that constitutes a crime that there's probable cause um, to charge this, or send this crime to a prosecutor? And that prosecutor reviews that, that report and goes, well, is this really, is this, should this even be in the system? Should this even be something that um, has reached the level of, should be charged as a crime? Or is it even serious enough to, to be a crime? Um, we like that sometimes because if somebody's going to take the blame for it not to go anywhere, you can be the prosecutor. <laughs> but I can tell you, it really starts with the police officer. They truly have to step up to the plate and decide, look, this is something that, due to this person's abilities and disabilities, cannot be a crime. <clears throat> or this is not considered going to be a criminal matter. Nor is it going to help to put this person into a criminal system to change things. It's not going to change. Something Bruce Tab taught me among the many, many things is that when it comes to special needs people, when they hit the, the legal issue, it's about supports. You're not going to fix them. Even in mental health, sometimes it's about medication and some things like that. But with our kids, it's about support. And you can't, the judge can't mandate supports because the state only has so much money and there's things and there's families and all this stuff. So our kids, these individuals in the, the legal system is just a travesty that's going to go nowhere, yet they're there. Um, just again, this is an interesting dialogue to carry outside of this room. What do we do with this? How can we work with the judges and say, okay, there's a mental health court, but what about a DD court? And how, what does that even mean? Um, how can we do this different? Because there's got to be ways. Rich, I know you have, we've got, so we've got a representative from Kittitas Fire and Rescue. And obviously, we think about that a lot. What's going to happen if there's a fire? Um, 
and I'm incapacitated. So tell me your, your take on this. What can we do? How can we work with the fire departments and that type of first response? Most of what we do, so you understand this, in Lower Kittitas County is provide emergency medical services and statistically twice in your lifetime you're going to call for emergency medical systems, every single person. So we're going to interact with children, adults with developmental disabilities. Um, and we don't always, you, there's not always a support network for those people when we're called. Um, and so the reason I'm actually here is, is to start trying to build some things that we can do to sort of recognize that and some coping skills I can give for the um, EMTs and the paramedics. But in terms of what you guys can do, um, we have the same system, we have the same dispatch center. Um, you know, if you have, you know, if your, your child or someone you're living with is in a position sort of to not take care of themselves in the event of a fire, um, that can be noted in the dispatch software and that kicks up and then they communicate that to us. You can put in where they are in the house. We can pre-incident plan your specific house. Um, you know, we can have a floor plan uh, loaded into the system um, and pop up as the responders are headed out to your house. Um, so we can have the information available to you. Um, the problem is, is that in that case, seconds and minutes matter. And we, not, we might, you know, if you live out in Badger Pocket, we're 20 minutes away. Um, so, you know, the problem with that is, is that you probably want to do some things internally to hopefully mitigate the problem before we get there if it's a fire situation. For emergency medical services, you know, like I said, to, to the best of uh, your ability, if there is a system that we can develop locally and maybe it's adopted, you know, that sort of lets us know that there are issues. We are not permitted, for, for people that are under 18, we're not going to take um, your child to the hospital without talking to you first, mm -hmm. unless we diagnose or we can identify a life-threatening emergency. We're just not going to do it. We're not even going to do some of the interventions that you might think that we would normally do. Uh, there was a high school kid today dislocated his knee and broken femur in a soccer game. We're not going to give him pain medication until we can talk to the parents um, because some parents would react very negatively to that and we need their permission. Now if he was having trouble breathing, we would simply treat it and take him to the hospital and we would just deal with that. But we'll likely involve law enforcement, um, you know, if it's a sort of you know, fairly low level medical emergency um, to assist us. We're not going to, you know, just drop your son, daughter, brother, sister, mother, father off at the emergency room and leave them there. Um, we very rarely come across somebody who's not, you know, we don't know what their identity is. So, um, you know, really what, the reason I'm here is, is that, you know, I, I want to avoid that happening to the extent possible and my guess is the law enforcement deals with it much more often than we do. Um, and we work very closely with law enforcement, so there's a partnership there. So there's a lot of alternatives available to you, but um, like I said, the thing that I'd like to, to get out of this is some ways that we can sort of identify for our providers when there isn't a support network around so they can recognize it. And if there are some simple things that we can do to sort of avoid escalating the situation or misdiagnosing the situation, I want to be able to do that because it doesn't do anybody any good to have a bad outcome. Right, and I know that there's some people in the community working on helping communicate with nonverbal. It's cool that there's so many pieces, but we also don't know what each other is doing. And I have my proposal to how to solve that. I can look at my wife who's not here and say she should be the, the hub for all of this. But um, there are some starts here. To me, this is the coolest part of this whole conversation is how do we continue this beyond this room? Because we all want the best outcomes. We may have good outcomes now, but they can be better. And they may be good from one perspective, but not so good from another perspective. But we don't know that other perspective. So how can we keep this dialogue going? I know that, Rich, do you guys participate in the law enforcement CEO meetings or whatever that group is called? I'm not sure what you're talking about. Okay, I don't know either, but that's what they told me. Um, let's see, law enforcement gathers as a group and talks about stuff. Um, do you participate in that? Probably not. Yeah, um, for emergency management, we do. Like, we work very well with um, Elmer Police Department. Yeah. Um, you know, probably less closely with the Sheriff's Office and, you know, very closely with CWPD. I mean, it, it, it 
it's sort of situational, but um, there are connections, and this, this is what my job is. You know, if there's a meeting, then I'm supposed to show up, although I hate meetings. Um, <laughs> if there's a meeting, I'm supposed to be out here. Uh, yes. So we'll sort this out. Then I want to continue. Yeah, but I'm going to be here. I don't know if the panelists are going to be here, but you're welcome to come and talk and so forth. Thank you all so, so much for putting up with this. that I would let her talk, and she's actually putting together something like this coalition. So, um, oh, thank you very much for it. Um, it's, it's been um, so reinforcing to hear all of your comments tonight. When I came to this community four years ago, I followed my grandson here to be of support to him. He's now 12 years old, his wonderful teacher sitting over here, Peggy. And so many of you have provided encouragement and support in many ways, and Michelle was a tremendous resource. I've been um, benefiting over the years by attending those parent-to-parent -parent meetings that I could, and the network is, has been great. I've, I've always, though, had this compelling um, vision that we can all work together. There's so many resources in this community, but we need to interface and dovetail we need an organization that is broad-based and well-supported. Um, and so, uh, a couple of months ago at a garden club, believe it or not, um, and I'm not gonna give you all the details because I know it's late, but the garden club approved um, Garden of the Month Awards, and then out of that came um, a garden tour that will benefit an autism foundation. It's Autism, Lifelong Living and Learning. And we have uh, uh, one of our board members here, uh, a person that is also going to be serving on our advisory committee for funding and membership, and then a friend of uh, Autism, Lifelong Learning and Living. And so we are doing the legal things to put this together. Uh, Jamie came up with the idea last quarter to refer an intern to me that works on developing a buddy family program and that just seems to be a really good way to start gathering people together and it's very well detailed. Um, I'm going to be bringing it to many of you and to service organizations um, to um, explain what it's all about and, and also the big picture as well as the immediate picture. If you are interested and want to be involved in any way, I know each of you have much to contribute and you're so welcome to join with us because we want it to be very broad-based, highly integrated, interdisciplinary. Um, this community has tremendous opportunity to be the face of autism. Uh, I, I am so um, dedicated to individuals with special needs, not just autism, but because of the prevalence of autism and the facts that were presented tonight and the conditions and the situations, we all know that we have to do something dramatic or our world will cave in on us if we don't put proper programs and support systems in place to serve the individuals in our world who are affected by autism. So uh, we have some paper. If you want to give name, email, um, please see any of the four of us up here. Thank you. We will also send a to anyone who gave us their contact information there. Michelle also will forward the information on how to contact Sue and her organization. Um, Dean? Before we close, I want to thank you and the lot of members of the lot of in the category of odd fellows, it's heartwarming to see these rooms full again. This is an odd fellowship all about. Thank you.